Welcome to the Layman Seminary. I'm continuing the series Final Destiny, and we're in the book of Exodus now as we're going through this. Okay. So the first slide that we see, oh, where'd it go? Uh, we're going to be go uh, starting with Exodus 4.23, okay, or uh, 4.22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And uh, so I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Now, the first observation that we see here is that the nation of Israel is described as God's son his adopted son, basically. Uh, this language will be used for kings later on, and of course it's used for believers. Um, here you see that because he will not allow, uh, Pharaoh will not allow the first burn to go, that the, the, he will God will kill his firstborn. And that happens in the, the death of the firstborn, the final plague. And the reason this is significant is because we're talking about physical death being in view as temporal judgment of what's going on. And yeah, it's a polemic. Yeah, it's a war, uh, the true God against the false God and those that claim to be God. You know, the Pharaoh thought he was the uh, mediator uh, between God and earth or whatever you want to call the terms. But um, anyway, we just want to have that primary idea here about Israel as God's son. Okay, so right here it says, even though Israel had become God's firstborn son, the entire wilderness generation, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, all right, so, uh, forfeited their inheritance due to the firstborn. And later on this, we'll talk about it. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a passage in scripture, and we'll get to it in the future, where it says that Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit in them. And some people think that means that only Joshua and Caleb and a few others were saved. But actually, the nation, the entire nation is, is saved. And we're going to look, look at that in a moment. At least at this time, they were saved. Okay? Uh, so, they, but, so what happened is the nation, as God had said to their son, they forfeited their inheritance uh, that was normally due to a firstborn. So God disinherited that wilderness generation, and they died physically in the wilderness. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and most of them died there. Okay. Now, Exodus 4, uh, 30 and 31 is, is key because after Aaron spoke all these words and he performs the signs in front of the people, look what 31 says. So the people believed. All right. Now, now let's look. look I'm going to read this more so this will sink in. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshiped. This is very important because this passage shows that when Moses and Aaron gave the message to the nation of Israel, the people believed. And it isn't just, oh, well, you know, yeah, we believe you're a miracle worker or something like that. You can see the response. They are so grateful. They are so moved from the idea that the Lord, Yahweh, the one that appeared at the burning bush that Moses had just uh, uh, experienced in Exodus 3 and that they told about probably. Uh, concerning that he's the one that's delivering them and he has compassion on their affliction and their response was that they bowed low and worship the reason this is significant is because a lot of times we have uh where people believe in a church service or something like that and then they worship maybe they hear play play a song or, or they're in fellowship with god and then uh for whatever reasons they fall out of fellowship with god after they've gotten saved and uh, some uh, go into the worst sins possible. Some don't ever get back in fellowship with God. Um, there's various situations like that. But what I want to show you is even though the words are not being used here in this passage, these people are bearing fruit. So the people believe, right? They're believing in the Lord and they're moved by this and they bowed low in worship. You know, all they had to do to be saved and uh, and I think they were saved before then, but that, uh, uh, a possibility, at least some of them were saved. But here it's a clear statement that the people believed. Um, so all they needed to do to be saved was to believe, but we see that they bowed low and worshiped as well. So anyway, continuing on. 
the Israelites as a nation revealed their regenerate condition. In other words, their saved status. Uh, when they promised we would do everything the Lord had said. And we're going to be looking at that passage next too. Um, well, eventually. They believed in the Lord that they bowed low and worship. And so there's other passages that we'll get into as we're going further. But just moving on. And see, the reason these passages are so significant is in the New Testament, they're referred to or alluded to. Like in the previous one, it deals with 1 Corinthians 10. All right, so in 431, they're, they're believing, and it says they believed in the Lord, and as a reflection of it, they worship him. They not only believed in worship, but they also put their trust in the Lord and feared him. And it gives a quote for that passage as well. We'll get to there in a minute. So listen to this. What other terms beside wicked, evil, or lazy will be appropriate for the person who sins continually to the point of physical death? So this is uh, talking about in context of passages that relate to sin and unto physical death. And it gives an example that the wilderness generation trusted in the Passover lamb and worshiped the Lord, believed in him, and were devoted to him and followed him. Yet though they believed on Christ, they were called wicked by God in Numbers 14 and were judged in the wilderness, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 5. So this shows that carnal believers can be lazy and neglect the so great salvation in the sense of deliverance. Uh, born again people, listen to this, are capable of murder and can live with such a wretched life and they can be called evildoers, thieves, and murderers, according to 1 Peter 4, 15. Believers do sometimes mistreat their fellow servants. No doubt, they do not think of it as beating them when they gossip behind their backs, slander their character, ignore them in time of need, show partiality and drag them into court. And it gives other examples for this. So my point is, is that how we understand these passages early on about the saved status of Israel at the time of the Exodus is going to affect how we understand passages in the New Testament. A lot of times the Passover lamb or the Red Sea crossing is used to picture salvation. But if they were already saved in Exodus 430, that means the type of salvation in view is a little bit different. And I actually have a chart, and I'll do this in the next video, is I'll break all that down. But I want to go through Final Destiny as it relates to Exodus, and then I'll follow up with that. All right, so continuing on. Exodus 6.4. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourn. So here he is. He's promising them, giving them the land, right? And so this tells us right here that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived as strangers in Canaan, meaning they had no property rights there. So this is talking about the word ger, uh, sojourner, which no inherited rights. And, and Moses actually named his son Gershom in memory of that. And so this is why it, it's important to understand what's going on right here. Uh, the, uh, so they're going to get the land at that time because it, previous to this, they were sojourning. In other words, they didn't have property rights. They weren't inheriting anything. Okay, we're going on forward. Exodus 12, 7. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two posts, doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. So here we got the Passover lamb passage. Okay, now listen to this. This is R.T. Kendall. And I, and I think I actually have this one in my library. I'd have to check. But he's a reformed uh, pastor or professor or something like that. But listen what he says about the, uh, the Israelites. It would be a serious mistake to dismiss the children of Israel in the wilderness by writing them off as unregenerate from the start. To say that such people were never saved is to fly in the face of the memorable fact that they kept the Passover. They obeyed Moses, who gave an unprecedented, if not strange, command to sprinkle blood on either side and over the doors. But they did it. If obeying Moses' command to sprinkle blood on the night of the Passover was not a type of saving faith, I don't know what is. And I don't think it's a picture of saving faith, but regardless, he thinks it is. And so that's what's significant here. These people were saved. We shall see them in heaven, even if it turns out they were saved. So it's by fire and it has the first Corinthians 3, 15 passage. So the idea being is that if they've been saved in Exodus 430, right? When we come to passages like this or his observations on passages concerning the Passover, I think there's another type of salvation in view. And I'll talk about that later on. 
Um, Exodus 12, 27 and 28. You shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshiped. So here again, the people are bowing low and worshiping. Then the sons of Israel went and did so. So he's, they obeyed the command. Just as, so here's a comparison here. The Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And so again, it's emphasizing their obedience by through repetition here. All right. So these are just some statements right here. Uh, they had bowed down to worship and trusted in the blood of the Passover lamb. And then it keeps on making some other statements that we can deal with in the future. But so the point is so far, they're bowed low in worship and they're trusting in that Passover lamb. As demonstrated elsewhere, the exit generation as a group was considered to be regenerate. They had believed in the Lord, had trusted in the blood of the Passover lamb and had believed in Christ. Yet the Lord says that they are an evil generation. Ra, and they will not see the good land of Canaan. So he's basically saying true believers can be evil. And then he's giving an example of Psalms. All right, so going forward here, Israelites in the wilderness who have believed in the Lord had trusted in the blood of the Passover lamb and believed in Christ. Uh, and so here's the statement about uh, Deuteronomy and stuff, and we can come back to that. It says true believers can reach a point where God will not allow them to go on to maturity. So that's like the language of Hebrews is later talked about. Um, Because he was angry and took an oath saying, not one of these men, this evil generations to see the good land, which I swore to give your fathers. Okay. Exodus 13, three, Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, from the house of slavery, for by a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out from this place and nothing leaven shall be eaten. Okay. And so this is in context of, of the, the, uh, the wedding imagery that's in the Bible. Um, and this is right here. Many of the feasts of Israel last the seven days. And it's just talking about how in Israel's history, various feasts can last for days. The feast of unleavened bread, for example, was crowned with a meal on the last day, the seventh day of the feast. And so basically they're relating the, the, the numbers and stuff to the relevance of, of a typology, if you will. We'll come back to this in the future. Not really important right now. Just wanted it to be an observation. Um, Exodus 4.30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. So this is talking about when, they, when the Egyptians are chasing them and the Red Sea crashes around them. You know, So the, the salvation here, this is not positional salvation from hell or the penalty of imputed sin. This is salvation in the sense of temporal deliverance. I would say national temporal deliverance because he's uh, um, delivering the entire nation. When the Lord Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So just because a person believes one time doesn't mean that they shouldn't believe more and more. I mean, it could be said that, yes, my one-time belief brought about salvation when I believed in Christ, but every time that I've expressed faith in my walk, in my journey, uh, that highlights <clears throat> it is in harmony with that initial belief. Excuse me. It says, by far the most common usage in the Old Testament is of God's deliverance of his people from the struggles of enemies. This is basically saying is that when you come to the word salvation, you shouldn't assume that we're talking about salvation from hell. And it's making the argument that in the Old Testament, the primary emphasis is dealing with struggles or enemies and all of that. And we'll go into more detail about a, a, a word study on salvation. I probably should have included one right here. We'll come back to that. Okay, so right here, the Exodus generation believed in the Lord and therefore were saved. They believed his promises and sang praise to him. That's from Psalms 106, 12. Uh, they said, we would do everything the Lord had said. They believed in the Lord. They bowed low in worship, but they feared the Lord. The latter term could roughly be equated with what experimental predestinarians refer to as submissions to the Lordship of Christ. They had bowed down and worshiped and trusted in the blood of the Passover lamb. 
by faith they drank, I'm talking about the rock, that is, they trusted in that spiritual rock, which is Christ. Regarding the people of Exodus, Jeremiah wrote, I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his heart, uh, harvest, declares the Lord. So it's describing what, what the nation was like in the beginning. In all instances that call to enter the temple of the land are addressed to those who seem to be viewed as saved. So this is just that idea of entering into the land is not something you do to get saved. It's a call to save people so that they can inherit. This suggested in the New Testament, the call to enter the kingdom may be addressed to believers, challenging to a higher level of commitment. This understanding is confirmed by the renewal ceremony at Shechem. And we'll talk about the Shechem renewal thing later on. Um, so this is the idea that the kingdom we're talking about is a messianic millennial kingdom and believers, even though the believers will be there, not all will be ruling and reigning. They'll have different degrees of inheritance and stuff. So, um, so something will uh, develop um, in future videos. As demonstrated in Israel, the Exodus generation as a group was considered regenerate. They believed in the Lord, trusted in the blood of Passover lamb. And even believed in Christ. So this is where he mentions about the evil generation. So we're constantly going back to these ideas that true believers can be evil. Okay, now this is talking about the community leaders, uh, uh, the core rebellion and all of this. And it says, since they had believed on the Lord in Exodus 14 and given evidence that their faith is genuine by being wise, understanding and experience, he's basically saying they were saved. Okay, well, here's uh, at 1431. The people fear the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. This is why Paul viewed them as true believers. And so when he's quoting, he says, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, but they drank for the spiritual rock that accompanied him and that rock was Christ. And then right here, 106, 12, then they believed his words. They sang his praise. So these are statements showing how Paul and the psalmist believed that the nation of Israel was saved initially, okay? Uh, so right here, it says, the writer probably has in mind, this is where I'm talking about, shall never enter my rest, passage from Hebrews. The writer probably has in mind Yahweh's terrible words to the believing. Israelites in the wilderness who have believed in the Lord had trusted in the blood of the Passover lamb. So this is just talking about the warning that they would not enter his rest. Because as Deuteronomy says, not of these men, this evil generation, shall see the good land, which I swore to give to your fathers. Okay, so we keep going on. And this is about the physical death issue. Um, we already read that, so we're good. Exodus 17, 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Okay, now this is important because he says write it in a book. So this is commanding, Moses is commanding them to write it in a book, right? And it's as a memorial, in other words, a memory of, and recite it to Joshua. And that's important because Joshua is going to take over uh, after Moses. And, Mo and Joshua had the responsibility to write it as well. And then throughout Israel, the leadership has the responsibility to, to write the law. You know, the kings will do that as well. But look what it says, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So this is the idea that you have a book, right? A book of life idea, a book of memory. And he's saying that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And, and whenever I come to this language and stuff, it reminds me of the Ten Commandments movie. Not saying it's correct or anything, but just whenever Moses had killed the Egyptian, the Pharaoh said that Moses's name should be stricken from all the monuments and everything like that. And then I remember his words. So shall, so shall it be written, so shall it be done. And, and uh, uh, it was forbidden to say his name or whatever, but that always comes to my mind when I come across this, because what they did was they blotted out Moses's name. And of course, in, in that, they're probably trying to explain why Moses' name is, doesn't show up in certain archaeological evidence at that time. But anyway, going on. Um, so check this out. In ancient Israel, the book of life, this is very important for understanding the New Testament. 
uh, was the legal register of citizens because everybody's part of the theocracy, not a list of those who would go to heaven when they die. To erase his name meant either one, physical death, as in Deuteronomy 29, or two, removal of the memory of the person. It never referred to a loss of salvation. In Exodus 32, 32, I'll go ahead and read this now, even though this passage we'll get to. Moses asked to be blotted out of the book that God had written if God would not forgive Israel. This is an emotional outburst expressing his deep love for his people. He's interceding for Israel. He was asking that God take his physical life, not that he forfeit his eternal destiny. In Psalm 69, 28, David asked that the non-believers be blotted out of the book and not be listed with the righteous. In other words, David's asked that they be physically put to death. So being blotted out can relate to that. Uh, physical death or removal of a memory. All right. So Exodus 18, 3. Um, so this is talking about their, the, their son, Moses' son, Gershom, which is from Ger, which sojourners. He said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. All right. And then right here. In the Old Testament, the alien was someone who did not enjoy the rights usually possessed by a resident. The Ger, or Ger, actually, would how you say it, had no inherited rights. Moses uh, named his son Gershom in memory of his stay in Midian, where he lived as an alien without inheritance rights. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived as strangers in Canaan, meaning they had no property rights there. Okay, Exodus 19, uh, 5 and 6. Now then, this is whenever he gives the Mosaic law. If you indeed obey my voice and keep my commandments, so the if is indicating that this is a conditional or, or dependent or temporary covenant. My voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own special possession among the peoples for the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Okay, so we get right here, and it says only those believers who obey him are priests. This is interesting because while it's true that, you know, in the church age, we talk about the priesthood of the believers, the reality is, is that um, in the Old Testament, it's making priesthood idea condition. And so you might think of it like this, is that uh, just because you're saved doesn't mean you'll be used by God. I mean. Yes, we have spiritual gifts or in, in that sense, but if you're not keeping yourself a cleansed vessel and prepared, then will you be taken off the shelf and used? I think Timothy uses that language later on. Um, so, but let me unpack this. Only those believers who obey him as priests. God's intent is that we will attain to the privilege both here and in the coming kingdom. But to say that a disobedient believer has attained that privilege is contradicted by common sense and by the passage above. This is seen in the book of Hebrews. Now listen to what it says in Hebrews. We are his house, his dynasty, if you would. Uh, if we hold on to our courage and the hope which we boast. So you can be disinherited from that. It's related to the idea of your priestly responsibility. And that's one thing I don't think people realize is when we're talking about rewards, we're talking about ruling and reigning with Christ. We're talking about serving if you will, as believer priests uh, in our glorified body. Okay, so um, look at this. Israel would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation only if they obeyed God's voice and kept his covenant. When we would draw, this time out in light of Hebrews, when we would draw from the exercise of our New Testament priestly worship, we are no longer fellowship with other believers. But this does not mean that we're not saved or that we have had salvation and lost it. Okay. Exodus 19, 8. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we would do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And um, I used to think the people were boasting or bragging or jumping the gun. Um, but actually, I think there's just showing that their intent was willing to listen to the Lord. Um, the Israelites as a, a nation revealed the regenerate condition. We've already talked about that, right? Okay, the 19.8, we will do everything the Lord has said. So that's what that emphasis is on. Okay, 24.3. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances and all the people answered one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Some idea. 
finally, a major purpose of entering the sanctuary area in the Old Testament was to renew the covenant. After hearing instruction from the priests, they made faithful commitments. That's the idea is there that we, we will do. And so this related to that idea of covenant renewal is that you're recommitting yourself, if you will. Exodus 30, 35. With it, you shall make incense of perfume, the work of a performer start to pure and holy. And so this is talking about uh, incense and holiness. And <laughs> honestly, I'm not sure I know what how oh salt i think this relates to salt yeah salt had many uses in the ancient world it was a seasoning for food and it was associated with purity so exodus 35 and so it's basically thinking about you know the salt losing its flavor idea uh, that's in the new testament and it's pulling from these old testament passages on that look at this newborn babies were rubbed down with it for cleansing for, according to exodus 16:4. And it talks about preservative and all that, but we'll get to the salt whenever we encounter it in the newer test, in the other books, other revelation. We'll probably get to it before Matthew though. Okay, Exodus 31, 14. Therefore you are to observe the Sabbath for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Okay, well, that's talking about physical death or being cut off can refer to uh, excommunication, um, different divine disciplines. So right here, the phrase cut off is often used as capital punishment or a severance from the covenant community, but never of eternal separation from God. Therefore, when the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews speaks of the consequences of willful sin, he means that there's no sacrifice protection from the temporal consequences of sin. Having rejected the sacrifice of and returned to Jewish sacrifices, there's no protection. He has in view the judgment of God in time, not in eternity, as these Old Testament records show. And we'll deal with that more when we come to Hebrews. But this is important because Hebrews 10, uh, I believe, is primarily about capital punishment because it's talking about the presumptuous sin or sinning willfully. And it talks about different types of sins in the Bible and numbers. And one type of sin, it resulted in capital punishment or excommunication. And that's the distinction there between the intentional, unintentional, or willful and non-willful, or presumptuous and non-presumptuous, or the sin of the high hand. Um, like, But it could be argued that Moses committed that sin because he didn't go into the promised land. But we'll deal with that when we get there. Exodus 32, 30. On the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I'm going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Okay. And uh, so we got some passages here from the New Testament about the deception. This is the intended safe soul from the death. I think that's from Hebrews and everything. We're intercessors with God, as was Moses, and there's the passage for that. And then it goes to the first John passage concerning sin unto death or uh, and so we'll deal with that when we get to first John, but, but the idea being is that there's an issue of praying involved here concerning this as well. So intercession is associated here, just like it is in the old Testament. All right. And then Romans nine, three is similar to when Moses is praying, blot me out of your book because Moses, I mean, Paul is praying that he would consider himself cursed from the uh, nation of Israel in order that Israel be saved. Now, I don't think it, uh, Israel being saved there is referring to them saved from hell, uh, but that's a whole other issue. I just realized that when I make this video, people are gonna see half my face, but that's all right. Um, to understand how Paul is using the phrase anathema from Christ, the parallel with Moses offer to have his name removed from the book that God had written is instructed. Moses begged God as Paul did to take his own physical life as atonement for the sins of the people. Okay, Exodus 32, 31. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin and they have made a God of gold for themselves. Moses was offered to die physically as an atonement for his people so that his people would not die nationally in a temporal judgment. This atonement did not convey personal salvation. Rather, it was for salvation from a natural, uh, national catastrophe that God threatened to bring on his people because they worship the golden calf. In the same way, Paul is offering himself as a substitute for his people so that the nation might not face the temporal consequences 
of the national rejection of the Messiah, talking about the tribulation, nations do not go to the lake of fire, individuals do. Like Moses, Paul is offering that he might die rather than Israel be destroyed. And we'll come back to this, but I just want y'all to have an idea of that so that we can see this unfold in the New Testament when the time comes. Exodus 32, 33. I'll start at 32. But now if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book, which you have written. So here we go back to that, right? And then 33, and the Lord said, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. So in ancient Israel, the book of life, uh, we already talked about this, right? Never referred to a loss of salvation. Um, David asked to be, yeah, we already dealt with that. And that's it for now. Um, I'm still going to do some on the inheritance later on. Uh, but for right now, I wanted to get Exodus out of the way. Uh, and so uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. So it's on the Leviticus next. But um, if you're blessed by this, subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell if you want notifications. Uh, keep this ministry in prayer, most of all. Um, share this with others. Give it a thumbs up. And uh, um, yeah, well, let, let me know what y'all think. God bless.